Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our midweek Bible studies tonight. It is a privilege to be here with you. We are excited about our time together tonight. We are uh, jumping into the book of Revelation, continuing with our study there, and it's been engaging. It's been very encouraging, and uh, we can't wait to, to be able to share uh, with you tonight. So welcome to each one of you. Glad that you are here with us. If you would do me a favor, if you would just put in the chat space um, where you're from. If you're not from the city of Atlanta, if you're watching outside, please put that where you're from if you don't mind. And if this is your first time, please put that in the chat space on whatever venue that you are watching. And also, would you share with someone and let them know that we're going through the book of Revelation. It's a very engaging series and you can shoot them a text or send them a message uh, now and have them to log on. They will be blessed that they joined in. I'm so glad that you are here with us and want to give us a big, big, big welcome to each and every one of you. Thank you for being a part of Bible Studies every week. As we come together to share, um, you're here, you're faithful, you're very de dedicated and diligent. We're just so grateful for that. We thank God for you. So let's pray. Let's ask God to bless our time together tonight. Father, how we love you and honor you. We thank you, God, because you are good. You are good, you are gracious, you are kind, you are a matchless and a marvelous God. We thank you for the ways in which you keep proving your love for us and you keep demonstrating your grace towards us. Lord, you look beyond our faults and you see our needs, you understand our ills and our woes, our concerns. Father, I thank you that you are on the throne of our life. And we know that all is well. In spite of the seasons we go through and the challenges we face, Lord, we know that you make all things well. So we bless your name tonight. We give you praise and we give you honor. Lord, I thank you for a good study tonight, that, Father, you will speak your word into the ears and hearts of your people. I thank you that the Spirit of God is moving and teaching and speaking tonight. Use us as your vessel. I thank you for a spirit of peace and understanding and calm to come over us. And as we study your word, Lord, would you open up truths in your word and allow us to see them. We give you praise for all that you are and all that you mean to us. Everything that you have done in our life, we give you glory for. Now we pause, God, just to worship you, to honor you, and to recognize that you are the giver of every good and perfect gift. Be with us now. Touch our time together. I pray it in Jesus' name. And all the people of God said, amen and amen again. All right, one more time, just want to give a big, big welcome to each of you. So glad you're here. Welcome to Bible Studies tonight. Well, there are a couple of announcements that I want to make certain that we uh, make you aware of. And uh, one is that this coming Sunday, we're going to be baptizing new believers on this Sunday. So we expect and encourage all of you to be a part of worship this coming Sunday. Don't miss it. We're going to have a baptism service and recognize new believers and those who have come into the kingdom of God, the family of God, and we're going to get a chance to uh, witness them going public with their faith. So I'm praying that you'll be a part of services and worship this coming Sunday. We're going to be jumping into our family series, and we've got two more sessions just about in that series, and so you don't want to miss these last two Sundays. It's going to be a blessing. We're calling it This Is Us. It's our family series, and we're going to be wrapping up our discussion on marriage on this coming Sunday, so be a part of that. And I also want to mention that this coming Saturday, we're having a special um, Super Saturday. It's this coming Saturday, Super Saturday. It's going to be at 9 o'clock in the morning, so don't miss it. Super Saturday, 9 a.m. If you are a new member of our church or if you've completed new members orientation classes, if you, I'm sorry, if you've joined our church, rather, and you have not completed new members orientation classes. You do not want to miss our Super Saturday. It allows you to get all of your classes completed in one day. All three Discover New Life classes 
are completed in one day. So Super Saturday is this coming Saturday. Don't miss it. And then on the last Sunday in the month, we're going to be celebrating Graduation Sunday on the last Sunday of the month. That's Graduation Sunday. So we are inviting and encouraging all of you to be uh, present so we can witness our new members who've joined our church graduating on the last Sunday of the year. It is going to be a great blessing. So we encourage and invite all of you to be present for that. And um, I also want to mention that on that last Sunday, we're going to have a special New Year's Eve worship service on that day. So there will be two worship services on December the 31st. There'll be the 9 o'clock service and then the uh, service at, for the night at 10 o'clock for New Year's Eve. So we know that we'll see everyone there on, on New Year's Eve. Now, please don't miss Christmas. It's going to be such a big, big blessing on this coming Christmas. We are expecting the Lord to do great things and say great things on this coming um, Christmas production. Every year, we always try to make certain that we celebrate and honor the Lord Jesus' birth in a very special way, and we are doing that on this coming uh, Sunday. I'm sorry, this coming Christmas, which is December the 24th. That's Christmas Sunday, Christmas Eve. We're going to have a special production and worship service that Sunday morning. So family, friends, guests, don't miss it. It is going to be a blessing to you and a blessing to the people uh, that you invite. Please share it with others and let them know that we'll be sharing together in a wonderful experience for our Christmas celebration and um, that they don't want to miss that. All God's people said, Amen. All right. Well, I want us to uh, prepare our hearts to receive our tithes and our offerings. Our tithes and offerings. Please prepare your hearts to receive them, uh, to give them rather. I want to ask you to be generous tonight, that you'll be faithful in your giving. I want to thank all of you for your diligence in giving on Wednesday nights, our midweek Bible studies. For those of you that may not know, every Wednesday night, 100% of everything that we um, receive and lift on Wednesday nights goes into the hearts and lives of families in our community. And so we take it into outreach, 100% of it, it goes to outreach, and um, we make certain that people are aided and ministered to and, and helped um, in a practical financial way through the giving and generosity of our church. Now, of course, the offerings on Wednesday never covers that full need. That need is far greater than Wednesdays, and so we meet that need through our Sunday offerings and through our tithes and offerings. But on Wednesdays, at least we earmark and designate 100% of that gift to go to that purpose, to meet the needs of people in a very practical way in our community. So give tonight with generosity as if you were to one day receive from this very same offering. So please give with that kind of spirit and that kind of heart. Don't forget our dream campaign. Every time that we um, raise an offering or give uh, to the work of ministry, I want us to be remindful that dream is underway. Um, we have a capital campaign here at our church, and we are uh, doing some amazing work in our community, amazing work in our church, and so we are developing a new community, revitalizing this entire area, and uh, we need your support in that. We're also enhancing our online presence and we're making certain that our ministry is modernized in the areas of hybrid ministry and providing services and ministry to those who don't live in the city of Atlanta but yet call New Life their home and making certain that we can connect with you through quality ways, through the airwaves as we are tonight, upgrading all of our systems internally as well as looking at youth ministry and how we minister to children and youth and developing a, a wide program that enables us to focus on the youth ministry. So I'm asking you to give to dream give to dream you can do that tonight um, simply by going to our website to give to uh, the offering tonight or to give to dream go to the website which is newlife-atl.org 
newlife-atl.org. You can click on the banner that's at the top right-hand corner. It says uh, giving. Click on the giving banner and it will take you to a landing page and share with you how you can give. Or you can take out your smartphones or smart devices and send a text to the word, I'm sorry, to the number 77977. You're going to send this word, New Life ATL. No spaces. New Life ATL. TL. If you send that to 77977, you'll get a response um, text back and it'll give you all the instructions you need to give. Those are the two common ways to give here at our church through our website and also giving through your smart devices or through your smartphones. Many of you may not have them. You can also mail in your gifts. Many people do that. We're so grateful to receive gifts in the mail and to receive your tithes and offerings and as well as your cards and letters and um, your support. So I just want to thank you for that. Uh, those of you that are giving through the mail, you can send it to the address that is on the bottom of your screen. So those are the three ways that we can give. Um, let's please make it a point to be generous tonight and be faithful tonight in our giving. Let's ask the Lord to bless our time in giving tonight. Father, I love you and honor you, and we thank you that you have called us to give. That, Lord, the work that you've called this church to do is a work that requires the generosity and the support um, and the input and contribution of every person who's a part of our family. And so, Father, I pray for those who are in our church family officially and those who are friends of our church who uh, worship with us and study with us. I pray now that you would allow generosity to break out in our church. And, Lord, bless those who are giving tonight, those who are sowing seeds right now. I pray that you'd return back to them a harvest that gives you glory. And so I pray for them and pray for their homes and households. Bless now our time together in Jesus' name. Amen and amen again. All right. Um, I want us to grab our smartphones or our devices, and let's all take a moment, and um, let's give together as a family. and it is done it is done thank you to each of you for giving and for supporting ministry and I want to also just mention this very very big thank you to all the members of our church and those friends of our church and people that aren't even um, a part of our church as a member but they worship with us and watch or they're in the building as visitors and guests and you really blessed my heart on last uh, Sunday in uh, my ministerial anniversary my wife and I both want to give a very big big thank you um, we do do the work that we do because you um, pray for us, you support us, you believe in the work God's called us to do. So on behalf of uh, Lady Monica and myself, I want to give a big thank you to all of our church family, all of our church members. You really made me smile really big on last Sunday, and I just want to say thank you to each of you. Your letters, your cards, your gifts, all of them, they've been so special to us, so thank you for them. Well, we're teaching in the book of Revelation tonight, and I want you to watch uh, this uh, video, and we'll be right back with the Word of God. Grab your Bibles. Let's get ready.
Amen. All right, let's get started. All right, Revelation chapter number one. I want to just read the first two verses because it sort of sets the purpose of the book and it tells us what the book is about. So I want to remind us of these first two verses of Revelation chapter one. Your Bibles are open and you are ready to study. It says in Revelation chapter one, verse number one, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place, and he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things which he saw. This passage reminds us that this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It is his revelation, not John's revelation, but Jesus's revelation. And it is from the, uh, the Greek word apocalypsis, which it speaks of the Hebrew apocalypse, which is in essence an unveiling. We have taken the word apocalypsis and we have made our word apocalypse, and apocalypse has been a word for impending doom and the end of all time, but that is not what the word means in its originality, nor is that the word what the word means as it is used here by John. When you say the when you see it says the revelation of Jesus Christ, it is actually saying the apocalypse apocalypsis of Jesus Christ. In the apocalypsis, apocalypsis, it means to reveal, to lift off away from and reveal. Apo, away from, uh, lupsis, to show. So it means to reveal. And this is a revealing of Jesus. This is showing us Jesus. Now, it's showing us Jesus in a different context. It's not showing us Jesus in the context of the Gospels. And the context of the Gospels is showing us him in his pre-salvation work, in his pre-salvation work. This is his ministry on the earth preparing for the cross. That's the Gospels. And then it doesn't show us a picture of Jesus in, uh, as it does in the Acts of the Apostles and in the epistles of Paul and John and Peter, James and Jude, um, and the writer of Hebrews. It it's a different picture of Jesus. In those uh, letters, in those writings, we see a picture of his post-salvation work, or this is the work of Christ um, in the life of the church through the Holy Spirit um, in the church age. This is the life of the church through the Holy Spirit working through the church. This is the ministry of Jesus through the Holy Spirit uh, to the church age. That is the post ministry, post salvation ministry of Jesus. And we're not seeing a picture of him in that light. We're seeing a picture of Jesus in light of prophecy or in light of the end times. This is a picture of Christ at the end of the age. What he will do, what he looks like in terms of his mission in terms of his ministry at the end of the age. Now, when I say a revealing of Jesus, or when the scripture says a revealing of him, it's revealing his nature, it's revealing his purposes, it's revealing his mission. This is the activity of the Lord Jesus at the end of time. The big picture of the book of Revelation, the big picture is good triumphs over evil, but not just good over evil in general, but the ultimate good. This is God. This is the forces of good. This is the elements of good, all that makes God, God, all that makes heaven, heaven, that it in the end ultimately will triumph over all that is evil, all that is wicked, all that is evil, the evil in men and the evil in nations and the evil in tribes and peoples all around the globe. So this is the universal good triumphing over the universal evil. This is the highest good triumphing over the lowest evil. This is what the book of Revelation speaks of. And so as we are reading this book, this is what we're reading. Now, I need to be very clear that in order for good to triumph over evil, which is the whole point of the book of Revelation, there has to be the idea of war and opposition and warfare. So that's what this book expresses. It expresses it in terms of the Old Testament's um, 
foreshadowing of it, calling it the day of the Lord. This is the day of the Lord. In the New Testament, it calls it the day of the Lord's wrath. Um, this is the day of judgment. This is when the earth is judged. Good can't triumph over evil unless evil is judged. Evil must be judged. This is not, you know, some power struggle between evil and good uh, only. This is really the judgment of evil by that which is good. And the judgment of evil is all evil. Evil. All of that makes the world evil. All that makes human beings have evil hearts, evil motives, evil intentions, evil actions, and evil deeds, it will be judged. And so we see in verse number 7 of Revelation chapter 1, as we continue our reading, it says, Behold, he is coming with clouds. And we spoke about this last time together. And every eye will see him coming with clouds, this great cloud of witnesses, the saints of God coming in judgment like a storm like a great cloud, like a stormy, uh, cloudy sky. This is how he's coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Verse 9 says, I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. He says, I was on the island called Patmos, and last time together we showed you a picture of what Patmos looks like. It was this place of exile that we showed. I want to continue reading with verse number 10 and just read down until we get to where we are today to refresh our memory on what we're sharing. I was in the spirit, John says, on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia. Now, Asia is Asia Minor. We'll have a map in a moment to show you this. And this is the, this is the crux of the Christian church at the time that John was writing, and these churches serve to foreshadow the whole of the church age, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. But he says, everything that you see, so the whole book of Revelation, all 22 chapters, is visions that John saw, and God tell, Jesus tells him to write what he sees in a book and send it to these uh, churches. And the churches are uh, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Verse 12, then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. I think it's critical to note that John hears this voice behind him, sounding like thunder, sounding like uh, this, this magnificent, thunderous, trumpet-sounding voice, and as he turns to see what the voice, who the voice is, he doesn't see a person immediately. What he sees immediately is seven lampstands. And then he says, and in the midst of the seven lampstands, verse 13, I saw one like the Son of Man. Son of Man is the New Testament title, one of the titles for Jesus Christ. So he says, I saw one like the Son of Man. He says, like the Son of Man, because... The last time John saw Jesus, he was in his human form. He had the nail prints in his hand and in his feet. He was in his glorified body, but he looked very much like a man, like a human being. He says, but this is the Son of Man, but there's something unique and something different about him that John begins to explain. He says he's clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow. So he has wool, woolly hair that is white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. 
He had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I mean, what an amazing picture. What an amazing image and vision to see. He says, and when I saw him, verse 17, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades, that's hell, and of death. So this means that Jesus says, I am the one who opens up hell or death, and I allow people in or out. No one gets in or out without me. He already has the authority in heaven. This is all power in heaven and on earth is given unto me. He said that when he rose from the dead. Now he declares to John, not only do I have power over heaven, not only do I have power over the earth, heaven and earth is given unto me. He says, but I also have power and authority over hell and death over hell and death. Every, every experience that could happen in the life of a human being, Jesus says, I have authority over it. Every glorious experience that is heavenly, he has authority over it. Every earthly human experience that a person goes through on the earth, jobs, careers, families, money, you name it, Jesus says, I have authority over it. Then every demonic, deep, uh, a dark experience that a person goes through on the earth that demons from hell or the, the evil that attaches itself to every single person at seasons of their life. Jesus says, I have authority over it. I have power over heaven, earth, and under the earth. And I have the keys, he says at the end of verse 18. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Now, verse 19, Jesus says, Write the things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. Now, that 19th verse, write the things which you have seen, the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. That phrase in the 19th verse is the full outline of the book of Revelation. I want to look at that phrase again. It is the outline of the book in totality. It says, write the things, three things it's writing. The things which you have seen, that's the things that you saw, John, that I just showed you, write the things you've seen. Then write the things which are, the things which currently are, the things that are happening right now, present tense, are. And then it says, and write the things which shall be hereafter. Write the things that shall be hereafter. That is future. So we have past, present, and future, which makes up the outline of the entire book of Revelation. It breaks down like this. The things which you have seen. That's chapter 1. He saw the image of Christ. He saw the lampstands. He saw the feet that are bronze, the eyes of fire, the hair like wool, the things you have seen. That's chapter 1. Then it says, write the things which are. That's chapters 2 through chapter 3, the seven church ages, the seven, church, uh, the seven letters of the seven churches. These seven letters represent what is, what currently is happening in Asia Minor, what John is currently addressing. There is persecution, there is the rise of the Roman Empire, the high tribulation that is experienced by the, the Christians in these seven, eight, these seven churches throughout all of Asia Minor. He says, write the things which are. This is the present tense. Then he says, write the things which shall be here after. That's chapters 4 through the end of the book. So in chapter 4, we have a rapture that you'll see. John is caught up into heaven. And what he sees from chapter 4 all the way to the end of the book is from the vantage point of heaven. He sees it from heaven. What he sees in chapters 1 
is from the vantage point of the earth looking up and he sees this lampstand. He sees Christ and all of his beauty. He hears the voice of, of, the, of the sound of trumpets. In chapters 2 and 3, he sends these things out to the churches. This is the condition of each individual church. But from chapter 4 on, John sees everything else from the vantage point of heaven. He is now in heaven and he's viewing all of human history, or shall I say, he is previewing all of human prehistory, what will happen uh, yet to come. Okay, and so that is the outline of the book. Now, I want to give you a simple, quick timeline uh, for this book. I've um, done this quick little timeline and uh, put it up uh, on, on the screen behind me. It's just a really simple little timeline that I'd love for you to capture. And then we're going to come over and take a little a look at this timeline a little closer. But you'll see in the timeline that the nation of Israel is formed in 1948. Now that's critical because as we study the book of Revelation, you'll need to note that Nothing that it says from chapters 6 on can happen if Israel is not a nation. So either it happened prior to the destruction of Israel in 70 AD, or it is happening after the establishment of Israel in 1948. So there are two possibilities of the dates of these events. One possibility is from the resurrection to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. In 70 AD, General Pompey and General Titus came in to Jerusalem from the Roman uh, Empire and they literally destroyed all of Jerusalem as a way of cracking down on, on Jewish uprising by obliterating the Jewish people completely. And they destroyed the city of Jerusalem. They destroyed the temple in Jerusalem. Jesus predicted this in Matthew chapter 24. He predicted what this day would look like. In previous passages, Jesus said that there shall not be one stone left upon another. And so this happened in 70 AD. That is possibility number one of the time of this book. Because this would be the things that are. This would be John is writing. The reason why possibility number one, it just doesn't square right because John is writing his book here in 90 to 95 AD, which means that this has already happened. And so if Revelation chapters uh, 6 and 7 and all the way to the end is referring to possibility number one, the time before 70 AD. It can't be because John didn't start writing it until after Jerusalem was fully and completely destroyed. It would not serve the same purpose of having John send this letter, um, this prophetic letter, if much of what is the letter is about has already transpired. So that leads us to the second time because from 70 AD all the way to 1948, Israel did not exist. Israel did not exist as a nation. The people were scattered here in 70 AD, the people were scattered in the Jewish diaspora. The Jewish diaspora is a dispersing of Jews throughout all of the known, uh, the known world. And so you have Jews living in Poland and Jews living in Russia and Jews living in Europe and you have Jews in the Americas, you have Jews in the South Americas, you have Jews in Australia, all over the world there are Jewish people including Africa and Ethiopia. So there's Jews living everywhere, most prevalently I may mention, uh, living in the Africas, in Egypt, and in those areas of northern Africa. But there are Jews living everywhere, and this becomes the case for about 1900 years, nearly two millennia. 
And then in 1940 through 1945, we have World War II. And World War II takes place, and Hitler has this campaign to exterminate Jews out of Germany, where a large encampment of Jewish people were from this diaspora that transpired 70, 70 AD. Throughout all of this time, many of them are now in Germany as well, and Hitler seeks to exterminate them completely in his concentration camps. And you know that period called the Holocaust. The Holocaust takes place, it seeks to exterminate Jews through a great genocide. When that happens, the United Nations, at the end of the, of the World War II, the United Nations make a decision out, out of a conciliatory effort to reestablish the Jews and reverse the atrocities that they've just experienced through the Holocaust, the United Nations established Israel as a state in 1948. That happened just in the last century. In 1948, Israel is established as its own state and it is given back its original homeland that it had during this period of time. It's given back its original homeland. Now, of course, we know that in this period of time, there were people living in that homeland, and so this is much of the fighting, much of the issues that are hap that's happening today, even right now, with uh, the news, with the Hamas war, Israel and Hamas, it is all stemming from what transpired in this period of time, and now we see Israel back in their homeland fighting on a regular basis for control and for um, power and authority or statehood in their homeland. In 1967, there is another war that's called the Six Days War. And in that war, Israel fought all of its surrounding nations around it and um, established itself as a world power, receiving direct help from the ally, allied forces. These allied forces are the exact same ones uh, that were established during World War II with America being the lead of that force. And so Israel being backed by America, being backed by the Allied forces, they, destroy, they, they uh, defeat their enemies in the Six Days War and is established permanently as its own state and its own nation having control of its own people and its own government. Now, that's important because if we come back over here to this timeline, nothing in the, book, in the book of Revelation from chapter 6 can happen. None of it can happen. None of it can be true if Israel is not a nation. If Israel is not a nation, then what we're reading is impossible, is impossible. The fact that Israel is a nation makes what we're reading very possible. It is now the second destruction, not of Israel only, but the second destruction of the entire world. Now we have the very next item on our agenda is the rapture. The very next thing to take place is going to be the rapture. The rapture will happen when that takes place. Israel is going to be invaded. We'll see this in Revelation chapter number 6. We know this as the four horsemen. These four horsemen um, from the opening of the first four seals of the uh, seven-sealed book. And this invading Israel. And of course, this begins a tribulation. And we're calling that year zero. This is the beginning of the tribulation period. This is the time when the whole earth will reel in a tribulation. And then from this, we'll see the first half of the tribulation, and the Bible teaches, and we'll share with this as we get to it, that the temple is going to be rebuilt. Now, whether it's rebuilt in all of its magnificent glory, I'm not sure, but the Bible teaches that there will be a temple in 
the book of Revelation. Now, there is no temple there now. It was destroyed in 70 AD. It has never been rebuilt back again. It has not been rebuilt back again because the people who have been living in Israel, which was called Palestine, the people living in Israel, which was called Palestine, these individuals still have rights to the holy sites of, of Jerusalem. Though they don't have a government in Jerusalem, they have rights to the holy site. We've been talking ever since the Jimmy Carter era about a two-state solution for Israel, the Palestinians and the Israelis coming together in a two-state solution. It has never taken place. The war with Hamas that has just taken, that has just happened October 7th, of them invading is an outgrowth of that desire for the Palestinians to have their own state at the exclusion and eradication of Israel. And now you're seeing Israel desiring to assert its statehood at the exclusion and near eradication of the Palestinians. And so you see this battle happening right in the midst. 1948 takes place. They become their own nation. The vestiges of this still takes place. It is not to be settled until the temple can be rebuilt. The temple will be rebuilt when there is a peace negotiation that is given. A peace negotiation. Haven't we been doing that? We've been trying to negotiate peace ever since this date, 1948. Trying to negotiate peace over and over and over again and have not been able to negotiate it but the Bible teaches that there will be a negotiator who will come and he will successfully negotiate peace and when he does this he will then he will then persecute Christians he will persecute Christians eventually he will eradicate that peace and persecute the Jews as well, and this opens up great judgments, martyrdoms, and great apostasy. The apostasy will come because the peace negotiator, whom the Bible is calling the beast or the antichrist, this person is going to establish a false sense of peace. When that false sense of peace is established, many people, including the religious church, will follow after him. Now, you may say, what church? The true church is gone. Me and you, we're gone. The rapture has taken place. We're gone. We're in heaven watching the next seven years of all of this that is transpiring. Then you will see the lamb and the witnesses. And these witnesses, you've seen them uh, as being given in the scriptures. And we'll see other judgments to take place. We'll see the great tribulation, the last second half of the tribulation, whenever the beast now exposes his original and real intent. And we see the latter half of the judgments uh, that will come upon the earth during this time. And then the tribulation will end, and it will end with a decisive battle which is what uh, Revelation 1 says when Jesus says he comes back with clouds. This is the second coming of Christ at the end of the tribulation and then we set up the millennial kingdom and of course that reigns a thousand years and we move into eternity from there. This is the picture of what the book teaches. It is a snapshot of the entire book of Revelation. Now, I want us to go back and unpack a little bit of how this unfolds, at least in the very first chapter. So I want you to look at verse 20 of Revelation chapter 1. Verse 20, Revelation chapter 1. It says, the mystery of the seven stars, which you saw in my right hand, this is Jesus telling John, the seven stars you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. Jesus says that this letter is written to seven churches that he is sending to seven stars who are angels of those churches. Now, before we get into much I want to just mention seven is a very significant number. 
Seven is a repeated number throughout the book of Revelation, but really throughout the whole Bible. Everything from the seventh day of rest, the Sabbath, from Genesis uh, in creation, it goes to the 70th year, which is the year of Jubilee. It goes directly through seven every seven years. Uh, slaves are released and redemption is given. I mean, there is this seven, 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 seven that repeat throughout the book, uh, throughout the entire Bible. The Bible has a list of various ways in which seven is used. And now in the book of Revelation, there's almost this rapid fire mention of seven. There are seven seals and there are seven trumpets. There are seven bowls. There are seven churches and seven lampstands. I mean, it's kind of, it's going back and forth. Sevens and sevens and sevens and sevens. This is Scripture trying to share with us something significant by repeating this number over and over and over again. And I want us to give attention to it in just a moment. But don't forget, there are seven churches. It means something. Then it says there are, these churches are lampstands, and there are seven stars which represent angels of the churches. And these angels are messengers, not, um, they're human messengers, not angelic beings as you and I know angels. It's the Greek word angelos, and the Greek word angelos could mean an angelic being, um, but when it's used as a messenger, it means a pastor or someone who is the messenger of a particular church. We know that as the angel of the church or the pastor of that church and we'll get to that in just a minute verse 12 says then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me and having turned I saw seven golden lampstands in the midst of the lampstands one like the son of man clothed with a garment down to his feet girded about the chest with a golden band his head and his hair white like wool as white as snow his eyes like a flame of fire his feet were like fine brass as if refined in a furnace his voice sounded like many waters he had in his right hand seven stars and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength and when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. He laid his hand on me and said, do not be afraid. I am the first and I am the last. The characters of chapter 1 are expressed in these four verses we've just read for you. The characters of the first section of Revelation are these. The first and main character here is Christ. He is the first personage of this particular section. Look at the description of Jesus. It says, if you would look at the description in verse number 12, it says, he's clothed with a garment. This represents righteousness. When it says he's clothed with a garment, this is righteousness. Generally, when the scriptures talk about the garments that clothe a person, it is speaking specifically about righteousness itself. It specifically gets this from the readings of the Old Testament. In Isaiah chapter 61, I'll just read this for you so you'll see the connection of the garment to righteousness. In Isaiah 61 and verse number 10, here is the way that it reads, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. It's using metaphorical language to speak about garments relating to salvation. And then it says, he has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. This is the garment symbolic of righteousness or symbolic of inner character of holiness, righteousness, and godliness. It covers us like a garment. The same idea is given in uh, the Roman Catholic uh, tradition from 300 AD on that the clergy would wear robes and the robes of clergy, of ministers, clergy would symbolize that they are clothed in the righteousness of God. It is a robe or a clothing or a garment because it's meant to cover our nakedness, to cover our shame. 
This harkens back to the Garden of Eden. Remember, when Adam and Eve fell, they realized they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together. God comes and God covers them with animal skins. This is God covering their nakedness. God covering their shame. God covering their sin. All of salvation is a covering of sin. You and I have sinned and salvation covers our sin. You and I are wearing the robe of God's righteousness, not our own, but his righteousness. We wear that robe because it covers the sin of our past and the sins of our life. So Jesus is clothed with the garment of righteousness. He's clothed in full righteousness, speaking that he is the one who brings salvation and brings holiness and brings godliness to man. Now, he is full man and full God. He's the God-man, correct? He's fully man and fully God. So he wears a robe of righteousness because he maintains still his human form. He still maintains his human form to this very day. When you and I get to heaven, we will see a man, Jesus. We will see a man, the Lord Jesus. We'll see a man with eyes and face and hair, a man, Jesus. Just as John, so a man. You and I will see a man. But that man is clothed and covered in righteousness, meaning that he is God fully and man Fully. He is fully God and fully man, clothed in righteousness. Now it says he has a golden girdle about his chest. This is a golden girdle that is wrapped around the paps or his chest, right in his chest area. This golden girdle, it is symbolic of the clothing that a priest would wear. This speaks of the priestly nature of Christ. He stands between God and man. This golden girdle is that which the priest would wear, which would give the priest the symbolic authority to speak to God on behalf of man. So the priest is the in-between, the go-between. He is the intercessor or the advocate. Now listen carefully. Jesus is our great high priest. He's made us priest unto him. So he is the go-between, the intercessor, the advocate between God and man. Now you'll need to read about the priest's garment, this girdle. It's called an ephod, E-P-H-O-D, an ephod that, that he would wear. You need to read about that ephod because it speaks very specifically about the names of the tribes of Israel being placed in the ephod. As a matter of fact, two big stones, two stones sliced in half and placed inside the priest's garments. A pocket right on the inside of that girdle is, uh, is the stones. And in the stones are written the, the 12 names of the tribes of Israel, six on one stone, six on the other stone, and they're placed right inside of the priest's girdle. You'll see that in Exodus 28, in the first uh, eight verses of Exodus chapter 28. It talks about the girdle and the garments of the priest. Very, very critical because the tribes of Israel always stay close to the heart of the priest. Jesus has a golden girdle wrapped around his heart, around his chest, in this area, an ephod that puts the people, his people, close to his heart. It's a sign of affection, a sign of tenderness, a sign of intercession that he ever lives, the Bible says, to make intercession for us. He understands our weaknesses and our woes because he himself was a man tempted in every area like we are yet without sin so he can be touched with the feelings of our infirmities so touched is he that the name of the believer is placed inside right over his heart this is how much he loves us we do not have a high priest 
who is not touched, who does not have sympathy for our feelings, for our weaknesses, for our sins, for our, for our mistakes, for the ways in which we express our human frailty. We have a high priest who is connected deeply and directly to us. He wears a golden girdle over his chest. And then it says he has white hair. Hair like lamb's wool. This is very critical. Not only does it speak of his possible ethnicity, amen, it speaks of his possible ethnicity. Certainly he is not European. Obviously no one in that area is. He's not European at all, but he comes from this indigenous people of the earth like Adam. Remember, Adam's name means earthy, <clears throat> red, earthy, man of the earth, man of the dust, man of the ground. And coming from that space, man of the ground, in Africa, in the Fertile Crescent, right in the heart of civilization, right in the crux of civilization is Africa, our people of color. And I'm not here trying to um, promote that Jesus was black. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is he is directly connected to the ethnicity of the people that are directly hailing from the space and area of the globe that he comes from, that Adam comes from, that God established as his first creation. That's critical because he is the last Adam. He's the last Adam. The first Adam fell. The first Adam sinned. The first Adam could not bring us righteousness because of his sin. So the second, the last Adam is Christ. And I think it is very apropos that the last Adam be akin to the same soil as the first. The same soil as the first. So it mentions here wool hair. Now, the second aspect of woolly hair, and for those who will argue that point, and that's okay if you argue that point, I'm fine with that. But the second thing that's critical about woolly hair is that that is generally, uh, wool comes from a lamb, from sheep. That's where wool comes from, from a lamb, from sheep. It's not only connecting him back uh, to the indigenous to the indigenous ethnicity of the Fertile Crescent, but it is also connecting him back spiritually to the lamb that is slain. You'll find that Jesus is considered a lamb throughout the book of Revelation. He's a lamb and he's a lion. He's a lamb and he's a lion. He's a lamb who was slain. He's the bloodied lamb. He's a lamb who has the marks in him. His hair like wool, speaking of his identity as the lamb of God, the Agnus Dei, the lamb of God that John saw, John the Baptist saw, and said, this is the one who takes away the sin of the world. His hair like lamb's wool. His hair is pure. It's white like snow. No, meaning there is wisdom. He is, he's wise. The silver hair represents wisdom. And he's pure in every way. And so his eyes as a flame of fire. In Malachi chapter 3 and verse 3, as well as Zechariah 13 and 9, two passages you might want to jot down, it speaks about the purpose of the furnace, the fiery furnace. This furnace comes to refine the metal to make silver and gold clean and pure, to purify that metal, take all of the impurities and dross out of it. That's the purpose of that fire. The Bible mentions often that God is like a fire that purifies, like a furnace that cleanses. The book of Hebrews says that he is a consuming fire. Verse chapter 13, our God is a consuming fire. That he consumes all that is wicked or evil or impure and he burns it out completely. This is what you see when you see Christ. It is the fire. Now notice where the fire is coming from, the eyes of Christ. The eyes pierce, they pierce, they see. He sees that deeply in our hearts which needs to be cleansed. 
He sees what is deep in our hearts that need to be cleansed. He sees the wickedness. He sees the sin. He sees the arrogance, the pride, the lust, the greed. He sees the mistakes, the ills. He sees all that's in our heart. And like fire, he burns it out. It's a, it is a statement of both grace and judgment. The grace is that he purifies it. That's the grace. He purifies it. The judgment is that he burns it in order to purify it. That there is a judgment attached to the grace. In Christ, you always see this perfect blend of grace and judgment side by side. You always see a perfect blend of grace and and judgment, mercy and justice, living at peace, at harmony, in the same being. As a matter of fact, that is what peace is. Peace, moral peace, is when mercy meets justice. That's moral peace. When justice doesn't allow for mercy to overcome it, and mercy doesn't allow justice to overcome it. It is perfectly blended in the person of Jesus Christ. And mercy and justice was perfectly experienced on the cross of Jesus Christ. On the cross, he both judged sin and he forgave sin. He became the judge and the justifier at the same time. This is the eyes a fire burns and it purifies. And so he says he has a voice like many waters. A voice like many waters. This is the exact same description that Ezekiel, the prophet in the Old Testament, gives of God when he sees God in the Old Covenant. He sees him and he says, his voice thundered like many waters. This speaks of the glory and the power of his majesty, his deity, that God is glorified. And I love this because when he speaks, it is almost as if all of nature trembles as God speaks. You remember in the book of Exodus when uh, Moses would uh, come up to meet with God at the Mount of God, Mount Sinai. And as he would come to Mount Sinai, the people could not come near because God would speak. And when God would speak, thunder and lightning, and earthquakes would happen on that mountain. And only Moses could withstand the voice of God. Only Moses could handle that voice. No one else could. They said, Moses, you go. We do not want to go to the mountain to hear God speak. Because God, when he speaks, all of nature all of nature resonates with his voice. He is the God of all the world, all of creation. And when he speaks, all of nature resonates with the voice of God. So it says it sounded like many, many waters. And Moses said it sounded like thunder and lightning uh, from, from, the, uh, from the mountaintop. This is all of nature resonating with him. That's, that's the first character, the first personages in this first section of Revelation. Second, second character, a second personage in, the, uh, in this first section is the seven stars. Number two, the seven stars. He says that he had the seven stars in his hand. It's called a mystery. So he says to us, uh, learn the mystery of the seven stars. Verse 20, he says, the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand. It's a mystery. A mystery is something that is symbolic. It is um, it's metaphorical. It's, it is to be understood but yet coded uh, It has to be decoded in order to be understood. It's a mystery. So it's speaking here of a symbol. And it's these seven stars, which he says to us in verse 20, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. So the seven stars are the seven angels. These angels is the Greek word angelos, and angelos means uh, messenger. It can be a divine messenger like Gabriel, the, the angel, or it could be a human messenger, one who carries the message of God like the prophets of old. God has established in the church 
messengers. The reason why we know that this is not divine angelic angels is because they are assigned to the church. They are messengers assigned to the church. And the church never receives its message from angels. Angels don't preach the gospel. Angels don't give the message of the gospel of God to the church. Ministers do. That's how God has established the system. The Holy Spirit works through human agencies to speak to the church, not through angels. Angels have individual messages for us. Yes, I have an angel. You have an angel. We all have angels who, speaks to, who speak to us individually without a doubt or protect us or minister to us in some capacity. But when it comes to the corporate body of the church, God has established that messenger to be a minister. And so this angel or these stars represent the ministers. Now, there are seven of them. Seven is a divine number that means completion, completion, perfection. There are seven churches. It's seven because it is speaking of the perfect picture of the church, not perfect in terms of sinless, not that kind of perfect, complete, complete. This is the full picture of the church. These seven churches represent the full picture, the full experience of the church. Now we know that the church is more than just in one decade, more than in one age or one period of time. The church, it exists throughout time throughout all of time, from when Jesus rose from the dead, from the day of Pentecost, I should say, excuse me, from the day of Pentecost all the way to the rapture, that's the church. Seven churches, seven symbolizes completion or the complete picture of the church. So he's looking at all of the church in every age, and this is a complete panoramic picture of the nature and character of the church, not the way the church was meant to be. Mm -mm. This is right, he says to John, remember, write the things that are, not the things that are supposed to be or the way things should be. He says, write the things that are. This is the reality of the church. Ephesus and Smyrna Thyatira and Pergamos and Laodicea and Philadelphia, all of these churches in Sardis, these churches have flaws in them, stakes in them, and they speak of the reality of the church. The church has lost its first love. The church has gone a whoring after idols. The church has, um, has a doctrines that are dishonored God in it. And the church is faithful. And the church um, will die for its faith. And the church is persecuted. And the church overcomes all of this, the good and the ugly. It's true about the church. And he says that write them. It's seven meaning it's a divine number. The stars represent the pastors of these churches. Pastors are held in high responsibility and accountability. You thought I was going to say esteem, didn't I? Mm -mm, not esteem. Accountability. Accountability. Pastor, you are responsible for the message of that church. You are responsible for the personality, for the morality, for the righteousness or lack thereof of that church. He judges the church by holding the pastors in his hand. He says the seven stars are in his right hand. Right hand is the hand of authority. And the pastors are in his hand. And the pastors have to give an account to him for how they have treated the church, his bride, his bride, his bride. If you do, if you mistreat the bride of Christ, you had better believe you're going to have to deal with the groom who is marrying the bride. That's how much he loves his church, that we're in his hand. When you're in his hand, you're in his hand to be coddled and blessed, or you could be crushed in his hand. Both the hand of Christ can, cut, can cradle us and it can crush us. And so these are the stars. Uh, the, um, the, next, the next personages, number three, 
Uh, the seven golden candlesticks. I have a two there by mistake. The seven golden candlesticks. Seven is symbolic. It's a picture of the church, complete picture. Candlesticks, meaning that it's the light in the tabernacle. And so the light of the world, Jesus says, is the believer, the church. You are the light of the world. He is the light of the world, and we are lights in the world. We are lights in the world. We shine from him. We shine from him. We give off light and produce warmth. We give off light, illumination, clarity, information. That's the light of the world. The world sees Christ through us. The world sees truth through us. The world sees what is righteous through us. We are the light of the world. We are the light that shines in a dark world. When the world is dark, that's because the church is not shining. We have taken on the same character and ways and morals of the world, and now our light is dim. It's like taking a light and putting it up under a bushel and hiding it, Jesus says. You don't hide the light so it can blend in with the darkness. You set that candle in the middle of the street so that it may give light to all who are in the house. This is how he calls us. Now, um, I want to conclude here by just showing you where these churches are and the significance of this location, the significance of this location. And so first of all, we see that the churches are representative, representative in an area that is right on the opposite side of Greece, right in the area that's known as Turkey. It is right near the sea, which is the Mediterranean Sea in this little area. And right in this box is what is called Asia Minor. That's what it was called in the days of John when he was writing the Revelation. It's now, of course, called um, the Southern Turkey. It's critical for us to capture because in this area is where we have what is known as the Middle East. It is in that general area, Middle East. You go further down and you'll be into the Middle East. You go a little further down, you're in Iraq, Iran, and all those areas. What transpired is here in this area, the church relocated from Jerusalem. You have a relocation of the church from Jerusalem, because Jerusalem, as I told you before, it was destroyed in 70 AD. The temple was destroyed in 70 AD. Jerusalem and the Jews had come up under great persecution by Rome, by Nero and Domitian. And so these persecutors destroyed Israel and Israel was no more. Israel was called Palestine. It was no more. And many of these Jews, they flew, they, um, they, uh, they ran to other areas, and a large portion of those areas is running up to Turkey or Asia Minor and forming churches there. And so you have the church of Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamum and Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. These churches are significant in that every, every sin, vice, wickedness, and evil that exists in all churches throughout history can be found in these seven. The areas around these seven is steeped in idolatry, Rome controls all of this area, and Rome has established its own religion in these areas. One of its religions is, of course, uh, mythology, and uh, one of its Greek gods is Diana or Artemis, the goddess, uh, and that goddess has a temple in Ephesus. Zeus is said to have fallen down in Pergamum. Zeus is said to have had his son in Pergamum, and you find each one of these states, each one of these cities have some idol god, Zeus or Artemis or Diana or one of these idol gods as the patron god. And all of these cities bow to Caesar, to the Roman, the Roman emperor who made himself a god. 
And so the Roman Caesar or the Roman emperor makes himself a god. And all of these cities, they thrive because Rome gives them power and resources and funds. They become heavy commercial areas. They become mainstays, big city states to this very day. Many of them have critical, um, critical import in this area. And these are the strategic churches that God establishes through the Apostle Paul, through the early church apostles, through Peter and John and the rest, as they're going out, they're ministering and establishing these churches in these critical, very sinful areas. Every vice that is known to the church age so far can be seen in this area. This is the locus that this is the locale of the activity of the end times. And this is how the end times, this is how Christ establishes his end time, uh, his end time destruction upon mankind. He does it through this very location. Rest assured, rest assured, these seven churches represent the larger view of the church. The European church, the Western church, the Eastern church. It represents the African church. It represents the American church. We're going to learn about Babylon as we go forward. And when we study Babylon, world powers, the larger power that engulfs all of the church is seen in this one term, Babylon. It engulfs all of the church, all of religion, all of politics, all of the geopolitical landscape, and you'll see it in the book of Revelation. This could not have been a more perfect place to write this letter that would forecast everything that will happen and all that transpires throughout all of human history. You and I are living the same old life as it was in the Bible. Nothing is new under the sun. The same things then are now. And we'll talk more about it on next week when we come together and we start looking and studying the first church. And that is the church of Ephesus as we'll look at this, the structure of those letters. All right. That's our lesson. Let's stop tonight. And um, thank you for sharing and being with us. We praise God for you. I hope that you are learning. I hope you're growing. I hope this is making sense to you and you are connecting uh, with this. It is a study. So we're going to take our time and walk through this book. It is a study, but it's a study that I believe is going to benefit your life in a great way. Um, Father, I pray that you would touch your people now as we dig deeper in this book. I pray, God, that you will help us to see ourselves in the midst of it help us to see a picture of you help us to see a picture of the church I pray that you will uncover the sins and the weaknesses of our church not just our church new life but our church our body our life help us to see our faults and our frailties to recognize our undying need for you to see you as the center of our heart, that our passions would be for you, that our heart would beat for you. I pray, God, that you would allow for this book to uncover and unravel the weaknesses in our own spiritual confession, that as we see tribulations and the persecutions in the book, help us to see our own response to tribulation and persecution today. Lord, teach us what it means to die for our faith. <laughs> teach us what it means to live for our faith. Teach us what it means to serve you in a hostile world with hostile influences around us. We desire to please you. We desire for you to look down upon us and smile. That God, we would fulfill your plan in the earth. That's our desire. So let it be. Grant it now. I pray in Jesus' name. And we'll give you praise. In Jesus' name. Amen. And amen again.
Love you guys so much. I thank God for you. Thank you for staying with us tonight. Don't miss next week. It's going to be great. We're going to jump right back in to this study. And please do not miss Sunday. Sunday, you want to be here. Make sure that you come ready to take some notes. We're going to talk about family and marriage. And um, we're going to have a blessed time. I love you guys. God bless. We'll see you Sunday. Bye-bye. Thank you.